everyone, I'm Marie Oldfield and for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm the CEO of Kunua Coaching and I present the Kunua Coaching Business and Lifestyle Podcast. On the Kunua Podcast, we discuss such topics as leadership, negotiation, entrepreneurship and lifestyle. Um, you can listen to us on all major platforms. You can find us on YouTube, um, Facebook and Instagram, just search Kunua Coaching. Don't forget to subscribe, click to subscribe. So you don't miss out on any amazing content or any amazing guests. And we do have some amazing guests, let me tell you. Today, we're talking to uh, Barb Hewson, and she's going to talk to us about leadership and negotiation. She is a leader in this area. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Kuno podcast, everybody. This is the first episode of 2021. And we've got Dr. Barb with us today. Would you like to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes. Hi, Marie. Thank you so much. And congratulations again on your first podcast of the year, 2021. How exciting. We got to start off on a good foot. So thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Barb Hewson, and I wear a couple different hats. Uh, first off, I'm a leadership coach and trainer. Um, so I offer leadership coaching. I create uh, training programs for businesses, customize, or I have a whole suite of classes that I offer, things like communication, empathy, emotional intelligence. And then the other hat I wear is I'm also a mediator. And so I do family law mediation. So I work with families going through divorce or custody. And um, I also do parent coaching. I work with parents who already have court orders. I work with um, parents and really just try to help them communicate and work better together. Um, and the interesting thing is I also come from a background of being a therapist. So I have a strong background in psychology and that weaves into everything. And so what I do is I try to just weave all of these skills together with mediation and leadership and parenting and all of that good stuff. That's absolutely fantastic. It's so interesting to hear about somebody that's doing kind of leadership and um, mediation as well, because I think that these two concepts are things that work really well together. But actually, sometimes we don't consider that. But actually, when you're a leader, you have to do a lot of negotiating. Would you be able to tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. And so, so mediation. So the interesting thing is, you know, if, if I, if I have a group in a room and I'll say, has anybody in here never had conflict? Of course, nobody can raise their hand, right? Everybody's had conflict, whether it's at work or in a relationship. And obviously the parent family stuff I do is family relationship conflict, but at work, we see a lot of workplace conflict stuff too. And uh, it's interesting. One of my clients this week, we were just talking about you know, an employee that's just kind of causing some things to bubble up in the office. And so they're trying to figure out what to do. The leadership team was going to meet today. And so we were kind of talking about some strategies. So leaders, typically, they have to be able to deal with A to Z, right? You come into work and you've got emotions, you've got thoughts, you have behaviors. And sometimes we like to think we can separate, you know, the all these things from the worker like oh they just come in and they do their job and they leave but the reality is we're all people right and we do all have emotions and things are going to bubble up we're not going to always agree with our coworkers or our team members and you know we were talking my client the other day we talked about you know there's always one and so we talked about that one person in the office that always just kind of you know creates a stir you know he doesn't like to agree with others um, he always says, no, I, I hate that idea, that kind of thing. So leaders need to have a good understanding of conflict and what that looks like. And a lot of it is really, you know, I, I, a lot of the work that I do, the, the problem lies in communication, communication issues. You know, when something goes south, we kind of dig into that piece. And communication is a couple things. It's, you know, the words we say, how we say them, facial expressions or body language that's a huge part of communication and then the other part that i find people are not the best at is listening we have two ears and one mouth <laughs> and yet we're not the best at being good listeners and so you know i that's some of the work that i i help leaders with is really trying to be better listeners really trying to understand what people are saying, because if you can diffuse some of this conflict that's starting to bubble up early on, you're going to prevent all sorts of problems down the line. And this, you know, conflict can affect the people in the organization, the processes, it can affect the bottom line of your business, you know, it can affect 
the whole company. I mean, if you have enough conflict going on, the whole place could implode and that's not going to be very good. So it's, it's kind of marrying all these things together. So I always look at, you know, mediation, negotiation, it's all about communication skills. Are you a clear communicator? Do people understand what you're saying? Are you checking in with them? You know, hey, this is what I said. What do you guys understand from that to make sure everybody's on the same page? And again, just being a really good listener. So that's a big part of it. The other piece that's really important in negotiating is empathy. And I like talking about this. This is kind of that emotional piece that I think is so important. We always have to be able to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. That's kind of like the basic definition of empathy. It's like understanding your own emotions, understanding emotions in others and how that all plays out. So empathy is a big part that it's really valuable for a leader to have the ability to have strong empathy and recognize that, you know, there could be something else going on for their employees. What, what else might be happening here? And are they using that lens of empathy to figure that out and to encourage that in the employees? Empathy can be taught. So if you have people that don't really have good empathy, you know, you're not stuck. You can actually, you know, tell people and help them how to have more empathy. And it's really just thinking about like, what do you think that person was thinking when you said that? Or how do you think that might've impacted them? Or, you know, what could you have done a little differently to make the other person, you know, have a different experience with this whole situation or help them have a different experience? So it's really looking at your stuff and understanding where people come from. That's a huge part of certainly the family law mediation I do is I see lots of blame, people kind of at each other's throats about things. And I always try to stop them and say, how do you think this other parent is feeling? You know, when you do X, what's happening for them? Or when you say this, what's happening for them? And to really get people in that space. And all of that really helps in the workplace. And, you know, I can think of um, this great workplace conflict case that I had years ago, and it was two employees and one was a supervisor and they were, they were at the same level and then one got promoted. That can always create a little bit of a strange dynamic. And what happened was the one that was kind of left at this level, she was feeling some resentment. And then the one that moved up really took on this power position and just started hovering over and overtaking this other employee. And it was really upsetting. And she felt like, gosh, we were at the same level and now all you do is bark orders at me and you tell me what I'm doing wrong. And I just feel like I can never do anything right. And we kind of walked through that. And we, I did the same thing with the supervisor. I said, how would you feel or how, how have you felt? Like if you were in that same position and someone came down on you and to really get people in that space. And, you know, by the end, both of them were sitting there going, I had no idea you were feeling like that, or I had no idea that this impacted you that way. So that's, that's just one little example. But I think the communication and the empathy are kind of two of the big things where I see this leadership, mediation, negotiation, you know, addressing conflict, those things are so important. I think one of the top questions that we get as well is, is about kind of managing upwards. So when somebody feels like they're their boss is not treating them right or their team right but they're worried because there's an authority barrier there and they're not sure how to kind of communicate they're worried how to kind of manage that situation and then they maybe feel they need to be a leader but they can't because they've got no authority so how would one go about managing that yeah that's a great question I love that authority Barry that's a great description of that right we kind of put leaders up on a pedestal sometimes and then sometimes they fit into that role and they say like, I'm the leader, like this lady was doing, like I'm a leader, now I have all the power, but not all leaders do that, right? So the one thing that I talk to a lot of people about is what can you control? There is so much of your own stuff that you can control. We can't control other people's behaviors, what they say, what they do, but we can always control how we react, how we feel about something. And so sometimes, you know, if a leader, is not willing to be coached or willing to make any changes. It's a matter of like, how can I like beef up this, this other person to almost to find their superpowers. I always say like, let's get your superwoman cape on or your Superman cape on, right? So you're like a superhero and it's, and it's really learning how to like deflect all this stuff that's going on around you. So it's not impacting you so much. We tend to like to take all this stuff on 
And then we're the ones stressed out and the leader's not stressed out at all. Um, and so that's a lot of what I see is really helping people. And it goes the same for my parent work where one parent tends to be more power dominant than the other and the other parent feels like they're this big, right? We've all probably been in that place where we felt this big. So it's being in a place where it's like, how can I get confidence and feel stronger? And again, it's learning that, you know, what the other person says doesn't have to impact me. I'm letting it impact me, but I don't need to. And I don't have to feel depressed or sad or frustrated or helpless. And so that's, that's kind of the emotional piece that I work with. So not all situations can I work with both leader and employee, but if I'm able to, that's great. We can kind of work through that dynamic so we can kind of level it out a little bit. But if we can't, then I'll work with the employee that's really struggling. I can work with that person and say, you know, how can we, how can we beef you up a little bit so that you're feeling confident in your own skin and you're able to deflect what's what's coming off of the leader so unfortunately you know not all leaders have that ability to even be aware of some of that power that power dominance stuff that's going on how do you think it works when you come to a negotiation and it kind of feels um maybe like you're in conflict or there's some authority barriers or something in there and you're trying to negotiate something and it might be with, um, I'm not sure, another leader or somebody, that, another company or someone that you're, you know, having a, putting a contract together with. Um, that can scare a lot of people and cause a lot of anxiety because it feels very confrontational. Is there any advice that you have for somebody just starting to go into negotiation and, and trying to deal with that, not only emotionally, but um, strategically in terms of um, negotiation skills? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm a big fan of brainstorming. And um, if you have a mediator, which is a third party who's neutral, that's awesome, right? Because hopefully the goal of the mediator is to help both sides, again, be able to get all of their stuff out on the table, right? Like you're saying this and you're saying this and people will walk into negotiations, you know, kind of hell bent on this is what I'm going to do or this is what I'm going to get and I'm not changing. And I see that all the time. That happens a lot in my parenting stuff. When I go into mediation, I have people walk in the door and they're like, this is what I'm doing and I am not changing. And so my, my job, my work's cut out for me, right? When people walk in the door and they're like, I'm not changing a thing. Okay, well, let's think about that for a moment. So it's a matter of, I really just try to empower people to say, you guys have the power to make these decisions right now. My guess is you probably don't have all the options on the table. And most of the times that's actually what I see. So I do a lot of brainstorming with people. Um, for example, I just finished a mediation with a couple and we, we ended up having several sessions and it was, it was a, kind of about assets. So it was like dividing things and money and stuff like that. And they came in with, this is what I'm doing and this is what I'm doing. And I said, okay, great there's a solution in the middle, we need to find it. And so I was able to get them both to move towards one another. And, and the other thing I really try to do in the middle of negotiation is I praise people when they're moving. So I'm like, oh, I see you just, you just decided to change this a little bit, or you, you're willing to compromise here and, and really recognize that because that also tells the other person who's not moving like, oh yeah, I guess they are moving. And so it, it kind of changes the dynamic. So it's, it's a little bit of work. <laughs> Some days I feel like I'm sweating by the time <laughs> I'm like, come on, you guys, you can do this. <laughs> but it's, it's really a lot of like, you know, there's, I always tell people there's always a solution. It's in there somewhere. We just need to find what it is, right? We just, we need to like do a little digging and, and come up with, I've had couples and, and teams come up with solutions that I never would have thought of and they had never thought of. And it's just like, it's, crazy ideas as you have, let's just throw them out there because you never know what other idea can, can be sparked from that. So that's a lot of what I do. And sometimes just the brainstorming itself will kind of calm people down a little bit. Cause it's like, you know what, there's, there's, I hear you here and I hear what you're saying here, but there's some other solutions we haven't thought of yet. Let's, let's figure out what those are. And people are willing to do that. And my experience is you know, they, they get so locked in their own thing, like, this is what I'm doing. They don't even consider anything else, but when they're forced to 
think outside the box and really, you know, I provide that space and time for them to do that. They can actually do it. <laughs> Things actually move. <laughs> do you think that there's a difference between the type of kind of family negotiation and um, maybe negotiating, a, trying to negotiate a salary or a business deal? Do you think there's differences? And if so, what are they? You know, that's a good question, because again, I, th I think a lot of it comes down to what I mentioned earlier, like the communication and the empathy, I think is really important. And, you know, the piece that misses that's missing for a lot of people when they walk in the door and they're feeling really scared and nervous is just that confidence, you know, like a salary negotiation. What a great example, right? We're always thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. Like, I want another $5,000, but I don't know if I should ask for it. And it's that confidence piece. And, you know, so you kind of view people differently when they walk in and they're like, well, maybe, you know, is there any way I could get like an extra $5,000, right? Versus here's what I would like. And this is what I would need in order for me to do this job. I need, you know, this salary and these benefits or whatever. And you present very different when you're able to walk in the door with some confidence. And so, and again, confidence, if I had a magic wand, I would just be waving it right and left, giving people more confidence. But that's something that, you know, again, it's with support, people feel stronger and they're able to come into a negotiation saying, oh, you're right. Like I do deserve, you know, more money or I do deserve to have more time with my kids because they're my kids. And so I'm going to stand strong on that and say, this is really what I need. It's kind of a, what do you need? We're not the best at saying what we need either. <laughs> That's one of those tricky things. So it sounds like communication and confidence are really key within this area. Um, how much do you think that comes back to mindset? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> I love mindset. So I, I use a lot of mindset work in my coaching and I, I base a lot of my stuff on Carol Dweck's work and she looked at a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And when you're in a fixed mindset, that's the whole place of like, oh, this is all I deserve. This is, you know, I'm never going to be able to make more money or I'm not smart enough to make more money. That's a fixed mindset. And a growth mindset is, you know, I haven't made more money yet. She likes to use the word yet in her work, which is great, which, which again, keeps the door open. You know, I have this tough problem. I don't, you know, fixed mindset would say like, I can't do it. There's no way. I don't know how to do it. A growth mindset would say, I don't have the solution yet. I'm going to, I'm going to keep working on it. I'm going to figure out what it is. So that's a, a huge, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's such an important piece for, you know, when we get stuck in whatever it is, family stuff, work stuff, we get stuck because our thinking, you know, our little brain gets going. And again, we say, I'm not smart enough to be the leader or I'm not, I, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I actually had a leader say that to me recently, like, I don't know. I feel like a phony. Like, I don't know if I really know what I'm doing. I got promoted into this job and, you know, that's the fixed mindset. So really trying to open that door and look at, you know, mistakes or opportunities, you know, anything that, that needs to be changed or we want to do differently. That's always an opportunity for growth. We're all human. We all make mistakes. And so I really try to help people see that difference between the mindsets. And again, that's something you can learn if you kind of grew up in this fixed mindset state you can always change, you know, again, it's even just adding the word yet. I don't know how to do this yet, or I don't have a solution yet, or I haven't made more money yet, or I don't have a new product yet, keeps that door open so that there's always possibilities. So that's a great question. It can be very hard to get out of that mindset though. I had a discussion a couple of podcasts back on this and we were talking about how not only do you have to have more confidence in yourself, you have to be able to, um, you know, not limit yourself. And I think as humans, we tend to limit ourselves a lot. And then we tend to get a little bit defensive because we know that we've limited ourselves and then we can't get out of it. And especially in, in leadership, when you've got to take care of maybe, I don't know, 20 people and, and you've got a huge team and each person's individual and different. If you've got some of these limited mindsets, it's very hard to start connecting with everybody on a personal level, build the relationships, understand what they need from you and then provide that. Um, is there any kind of, you know, not quick fixes, but things that people can do to kind of get over that, especially as leaders? You know, and that, that's a great um, topic too, because um, one of the things that I think is really important 
for leaders is to really focus on your people and you get so caught up in, you know, again, the paperwork, the processes, the product that needs to get out the door or whatever it is, right? We get so focused on deadlines and schedules and all this, all the logistics. And the reality is without those 20 people, you may not even have a company. And, you know, this is a great thing that I work with leaders on is how can you really connect in more with your people? Um, so for example, I had someone who said, you know, I always tell people like, you know, my door is open. You can always come in and sit down anytime. But he said they never do. And I said, well, <laughs> and he's such a nice approachable guy too. He's not even like, you know, a hard person or he's, he's just a very relatable person. And so I said, well, how often do you meet one-on-one -on -one with your team members? And he said, oh, well, um, I don't know. You know, most people do like a yearly <laughs> performance review, right? And so I said, my challenge is don't make it a yearly performance review. I said, your people are your business. And, you know, I always, one of my favorite companies, it's such a great example is Patagonia. And Yvonne Chouinard started Patagonia years ago. And he's got a great book called Let My People Go Surfing. And, you know, he was one of the first companies that talked about, you know, daycare in the business and putting a cafeteria in. And the whole idea is if the surf is up, you go surfing because you're going to come back a happier employee. And so really like tapping into, you know, what makes people tick, what makes, you know, give people time to be creative, you know, don't schedule out their whole day with all these things, give them creative time. Um, and so really connecting with your people. So interestingly, again, one of my clients recently said, you know, I just met with him this week and he said, oh, last week I started my one-on-ones. And I said, hey, that's so great. I'm so glad you did that. And I said, what came out of it for you? Like, what did you learn? And so we talked about some common themes that came up. And I said, you know, the, the key with these is it's not one and done. So you've started them. So don't make that your last one for 2021 because you've got to be able to connect in with your people. And my goal for, for this person is I want people to walk in your door and sit down and talk to you. <laughs> you know, I want open door to really be open door, come on in. So I think that's something that kind of gets pushed aside sometimes with leaders. We get so busy. We don't make time for that one-on-one -on -one to really, because again, the other piece is sometimes people are doing a job that one, they may not like that piece of their job or they, they're not really good at it and it causes stress and anxiety. And so it's really like understanding and learning what's everybody good at? Is everybody doing what they really like to do? You know, someone may like charts and numbers and spreadsheets, but you've given it to this person over here and that stresses them out. So maybe this other person can do that. What is this, this person over here doing that's really positive and awesome or would like to do? So I think, you know, just really making time with those one-on-ones is so critical. And I think we just don't do enough of it. I don't think people know I don't think the leaders know their people as well as they certainly could. Um, some do, but in a lot of cases, when I, again, to ask that question and say, when was your last one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, it was probably a year ago. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> we need to change that, right? Really connect with your people. I think it comes down to as well, managers and leaders. I mean, you can be an excellent manager and, and just you know, throw people into whatever it is that is there at the time within the project that you need to get done. But actually, in order to really lead them and to get buy-in, if you don't know your team really well and you're not having the one-to-ones and you're not building that relationship, all you're doing is annoying them. Because it's like you said, if you're giving charts to someone that's no, you know, not really wanting to do it and there's someone sat there that does want to do it or wants a development opportunity, then you don't know your people. And if you can't do that, I mean... I've seen managers come and go like that. And I think that a true leader is rare. I think they're hard to find because I think that ability to build those relationships with the team is difficult. And my next question rolling on from that is having said all this, how does it work when we're all working remotely? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, like you and I are on Zoom. That, you know what, that's a great question. So, you know, it's interesting, everybody kind of fell into Zoom last year when, when quarantine hit and all these other things. You know, I have someone, I'm someone that's been using Zoom for years. It's, to me, it's like kind of the next best thing if you can't actually be, you know, in person with your team. You know, Zoom's awesome because you can do little breakout groups. 
which is a nice feature. So you can actually have small group discussions. I think, you know, just being able to see one another like we are is so valuable. Again, it's reading the body language, facial expressions, all of that stuff is a huge part of communication. So, you know, we kind of have to do the best we can with all the remote stuff because it is kind of what's going on for a lot of businesses still. Um, so I think, you know, still having meetings on Zoom, um, not over meeting, meeting everybody, whatever the word is, <laughs> too many meetings. <laughs> um, you know, just being really careful of not having too, too many meetings for people so that they still have time to get things done. But I think the Zoom feature is, you know, any, any video conference software, I don't mean to just be plugging Zoom, but, you know, WebEx or any, any of these other ones that are out there still allows you to see your teams and be able to connect in with them. So it's, it's kind of like our next best option that we have right now in this crazy world. So I think it's still valuable and still useful. I think it can be harder sometimes to build the relationships remotely. It's not definitely not impossible, but I think as well, it's not even just a case of people are working at home. They may be dealing with their children at home now as well, yes. and they're doing other things. And I think as a manager or a leader, it can sometimes be very tempting to try and micromanage a little bit. And this is definitely a time where you can't, and you might have to accept that people aren't maybe going to do everything that you want them to do. So I think there's a little bit of coaxing and negotiation, but also some really good leadership skills are coming into it now. Yeah, no, great points. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, we're coming up to the end of the interview and I could just literally sit here all night, but, um, <laughs> you know, in, in the interest that we've all got other things to do, um, would you like to give us an overview of where people can find you and what services you provide? Because I see you've got a lot of different things going on. Yes, thank you so much. So yeah, so I have a website. It's Dr. Barb Hewson, H-U-G-H-S-O-N.com. And that's where my leadership stuff is. So I do coaching. I have a few classes online, but I love doing in-person classes. One of the things I did a lot of last year, I actually just did one a couple nights ago, is um, I do talks for rotary clubs and chambers and things like that. Last year, my one of my hot topics was creative leadership. So I was trying to really guide people into ways that you know, now's the time you got to be more creative and you made widgets, but now you need to make widgets and something else or completely shift gears. Um, so my drbarbhewson.com site, you can find any of my leadership stuff there. And then um, for parents or families going through divorce stuff, I have a website called portparentclass.com. And on there, I actually have like a divorce SOS class. I have a class for step parents. Um, I have a mandatory class that parents have to take um, that go through divorce. Um, and then I have a, a um, mediation link and I do what's called parent coaching. So I help parents actually work together. A lot of that's communication work. They may have court orders. So I help them with that. Um, and then also do parent, just all sorts of parent education stuff again at various places around. So either of those would work. Do you have any social media handles or is it just your website? Um, I have my, so on, um, I have Dr. Barb Hewson and Dr. Barb H. So I've got two different ones. So I've got the Leadership Dance is a comp is a um, a program that I developed um, for leaders. And then I also have my I have a program called Engage a Healthy Divorce Community. So I have an online Facebook, and um, parents come in there and you know I put videos up and and have resources and I have some. Um, little documents that people can get they can subscribe to my mailing list and they can get some stuff on i have one called how to how to win your divorce but it's actually not really about winning it's about how to have uh, a win for your kids so it's a little bit sneaky the title of that but <laughs> but it gets people interested it's like i want to win my divorce it's like it's not about you guys it's about your children so let's uh let's be focusing on the right thing <laughs> Well, it's been absolutely fascinating chatting to you today. Thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your time.